Good morning, FBCA family and guests. Thank you for being with us for worship this morning. Here's a look at what's coming up at FBCA. Don't forget, tomorrow is the deadline for the foundation scholarships. Adults, the fourth Tuesday meeting is this week, March 28th, from 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. There's special music on the program, so be sure to come. No RSVP required. It's time to play ball. The FBCA softball team would love to have you join them. The season is 10 games long and starts next Monday, April 3rd. Contact Courtney Burge if you have any questions. Vacation Bible School registration opens next Monday, April 3rd. There's still time to volunteer as well. So if you haven't already done so, go to fbcaalexandria.org slash bbs to sign up for what's always a fun, enriching, and life-changing week for everyone involved. The Annie Armstrong Easter Offering supports more than 2,400 missionary families serving across the United States and Canada. 100% of your gifts are used to train and provide resources to missionaries involved in church planting, compassion ministries, creating evangelism resources, and much more. FBCA's goal this year is $22,000, so please pray for this effort and please give generously. Easter is only two weeks away, and we want you to invite others to join us this Holy Week. At the welcome desk and in the front foyer, we have communication cards with information about Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Easter services. Take two or three cards and give them to friends and neighbors and encourage them to come worship at FBCA. You can find more information on our website and in the Beacon. In addition to our regular Sunday school teachers who serve our children each week, we need more helping hands during both services on Easter Sunday. Why not work one service and attend the other? Check the Beacon or the website to sign up and to find out additional places where you can help. Registration is now open for four new women's Bible studies starting the week after Easter. Check the beacon or the website to find out more information and to sign up. And now, welcome to worship.
Thank you, children. That was wonderful. This group will be leading us in worship on Wednesday night. They're going to do a little mini musical. I believe that'll be one of the songs. Yes. So please come back and join us. Every Wednesday night, we've been meeting together for uh, fellowship and Bible study. We meet around the tables. Pastor Robert brings a good word for us. We pray for each other. It's such a good time for the middle of the week. Please join us on Wednesday night. The kids, I was listening to uh, one of the lines. I stand with faith on your promises. I know you will never let me go. God is so good. Let's all stand together and sing about the goodness of God. The kids are going to stay with us and help lead worship on this song.
like for you to turn to those on your left or right and just say, God is good. And welcome to worship. Good morning, church. Good morning. So good to see you today. We are so blessed to have the opportunity to gather together in worship. Those that are here in the room, as well as those that are joining us online, we are so thankful to have the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ and come together united in our confession that Jesus is our Lord. If you are a guest with us today, let me just extend a special welcome to you and to your family. We are so thankful that you are here with us today. A couple of things as our guests. I want you to know that should you need any direction or have any questions, feel free to engage with any of our ushers at all of our doors. But we also have a welcome center. If you'll go outside of either door on your right or on your left, just down this hallway to the right, you'll find our welcome center there at the end. They'll be able to answer any questions that you may have, give you any direction or guidance that you may need, as well as just extend that personal invitation to you and your family as you've joined us here in worship today. In addition to our Welcome Center, let me also just highlight for you that if you are our guest, we would love to get to know you and your family. And one of the ways we do that is through our connection card. You'll find those right there in the pew back in front of you. If you would, take a moment during our service and fill out one of these cards. And then later in the service, as we have the opportunity to worship through our tithes and our offerings, you can place that connection card in the offering plate and we'll receive it that way. But we are so thankful you and your family have joined us today in worship. 
We are blessed this morning, every morning really that we gather in worship, but we're blessed this morning in worship because for some time we have had on the schedule Dr. Wayne Faison to come and lead us in worship by bringing a message from God's Word. And him and his wife, Cameron, are here with us today, and we are so appreciative and thankful for their presence and their leadership with us today. Would you do me a favor and give them a round of applause and welcome? And I have to apologize now in front of everyone. It's Carmen, not Cameron. I apologize. Forgive me for that. We are so thankful for their attendance and worship with us today and Dr. Faison's leadership. You know, we talk a lot about here at First Baptist about partnering together in ministry. We have multiple partners, both here in the state and around the world, that enable us to fulfill our mission in reaching and making disciples for the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the ways we do that that really multiplies our efforts is through our partners, such as the Baptist General Association of Virginia. You may notice that in our general budget every year we dedicate 12% of our funds to immediately go out of our doors and into the mission field contributing to this work. Of that 12%, 4% goes to the Southern Baptist Convention and 8% goes to the Baptist General Association of Virginia. And so we are so thankful for Dr. Faison and his leadership as well as his presence here in our church this morning as the BGAV is our largest missions partner. And we just continue to strengthen that partnership through his presence and his teaching and leadership today. As we continue together in worship this morning, let me do so by leading us in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity to gather together with one another. You have told us in your word that two are better than one. And so we are so thankful for all of our ministry partners. We are so thankful for the work that they are able to do both here in our community and around the world as we are united in our confession and focused together on our vision and our purpose to share the gospel to the ends of the earth. But Father, we are also thankful for one another, for the person that is seated to our right and to our left this morning, for the encouragement and for the strength that they provide. But Father, you have also said unto us in your word that the world will know that we are your disciples by how we love one another. And so, Father, I pray that the relationships that we have together with those who are gathered in this room would be a powerful witness to the community and to the world of whom we are, that we are sons and daughters of the King. Father, I pray that you would just strengthen our fellowship and you would strengthen our friendship. And Father, we recognize that there is only one name by which we will be saved, and that is by the name of Jesus Christ. And so we gather together in the name of Jesus. We worship together in the name of Jesus. And we pray together in the name of Jesus. We ask all this in his name we pray. Amen. Let's continue together this morning in worship.
Thank you, choir and Bill Marr for that lovely song, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. You know, sometimes we sing a gospel song that makes you want to tap your feet, and other times we sing something soft and contemplative about our desire to have the Holy Spirit come down and dwell within us. In the words of the psalmist David, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Please stand as we all sing in Christ alone.
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, First Baptist Church Alexandria. It's great to be with you this morning. I thank God for each and every one of you as you have come to join us in spirit and in truth. I've heard rumors about this second service, and so we're going to see just how true these rumors are. Amen. And you can confirm some of these rumors if I can get 10 people to just say amen. All right, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. I'm humbled to stand before you. I just thank God for each and every one of you. And to your pastor, I thank you for this invitation. I bring you greetings uh, from the Baptist General Association of Virginia, uh, of which I am the executive director of uh, five months now. Amen. So be in prayer for me, even though I've been with the BJV for close to 22 years. I'm originally from Florida, and I was sharing earlier uh, when my wife and I moved from Florida to uh, Virginia, I thought we were moving north, and once we got here, I figured out that we were still in the south, so I thank God uh, for, this, for this opportunity, and so we reside in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. I serve as senior pastor of East End Baptist Church in Suffolk, Virginia. I have been pastor there for eight years, so I want to give them a shout out in case they're watching. They've, they've uh, commissioned me to not only serve as the executive director of the BJV, but also uh, has given me latitude to be out and be a part of the larger church family. And so if you don't mind, let's just give yourselves and them a round of applause for this <laughs> glorious day in the Lord. So I want you to know as, as, as we come, uh, I have been able to travel around the, the, the state. Uh, maybe about a month ago, I was uh, in Abington, Virginia, down in the Bristol area, in the Lebanon area. And typically when I come as a uh, guest preacher, I normally try to figure out uh, how long the pastor normally preaches. And then I take five minutes off of that because if I do that, then I know I might get invited back. <laughs> but uh, as I was sharing in, in, in the Abington area, I asked the pastor, I said, how, how long do you normally preach? And uh, he said, oh, don't worry about that. He said, you preach as long as you want to. And so I hope First Baptist Alexandria is a similar type of church in terms of allowing the pastor to uh, and the preacher to preach as long as they want to, but then he added to me, he said, we're getting out of here at noon, but you can preach <laughs> as, as, as long as you want, but we're leaving at noon. So keeping, keeping that in mind, and as I was watching your announcement scroll, uh, there was this image of this uh, brisket sandwich from Famous Dave's, and and Famous Dave's is one of my favorite restaurants, and so you don't have to worry about me preaching any longer uh, than 12 o'clock as, uh, I don't know about you, but that uh, uh, brisket has made my mouth watered. And so speaking of mouth watering, we want to go and, and, and look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 37 through 40. Uh, I believe that God has a word for us this morning. God has a word for us in this season, season of time as we uh, are exiting out of a pandemic season. And I know if you're anything like I am in a church like we are, you have definitely been through something and trying to get and make our way out of this thing that uh, we know that has impacted all of us. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 37 uh, through 40, I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, and you will find these words. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul had his military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor. 
David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. Instead, he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pouch and in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. As we think about this collection of scripture, I really want to hone in on the last few words of verse 40, where it says, David approached the Philistine. This is one of my favorite stories in the biblical text. I don't know about you, but it brings me a sense of excitement and encouragement and empowerment. And I hope and pray as we engage this text and as we allow this text to engage us, that it would too bring you a sense of excitement and encouragement and empowerment. So as we think about that, I want to use as my subject, facing our Goliath. Facing our Goliath. I don't care what anyone says, uh, we have some Goliath-sized challenges facing us. Just look around you, whether it's in your communities, in your homes, in your neighborhoods, uh, on college campuses, in the life of the church. Uh, we have some Goliath-sized challenges that we are being faced with. I don't know about you, but things are just not the norm anymore. And so, therefore, we need to enter this life with our eyes wide open, with our ears ready to hear for what God has in store for us. And it's embedded in this story of David and Goliath that God wants to use for us this morning to help us, to help us as we come face to face with our Goliath, as we become face to face with our Goliath-sized challenges. Can I encourage you today? Can I encourage you today is that whatever that Goliath size challenge that you might be facing, don't face that Goliath size challenge unprepared. Whatever you might be facing, whatever that challenge might be in your home, in your school, in the church, in your community, in the world, don't seek to face that Goliath size challenge unprepared. And God gives us the tools in this collection of scripture to prepare us, to prepare us for our God-sized challenge. I didn't share this this morning in the early service, but I don't mind sharing with you that in terms of our church at East End Baptist Church, that people are not coming back the same way they left. And I don't know about you, but many of our strong, strong followers of Christ have gone home to be with the Lord. We used to have so many ch people coming on Sunday mornings, but now it's about one-third of those people. But they're beginning to come back, but they're coming back different than what they left. And they're coming back with challenges that they're facing, and they're looking for an answer, not only from the pastor, not only from the church, but they're looking for an answer for the Lord. And I stop by here to let you know that God has given us an answer as we look at this story of David and Goliath as he prepares us, as he prepares us to face these God-sized challenges that we are confronted with. But you don't have to believe me as we look at verse 37. It says that then David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. The first thing that God has prepared us with to face these God-sized challenges is our trust in him. I wonder if there is anybody here today that trusts in the Lord with all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their soul. Oh, you got permission for 25 of you to say amen on that one. <laughs> amen. That you trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. Listen. As we look at verse 37, it helps us to understand from David's perspective that David believed that if God did it before, he can do it again. In other words, David understood that if God gave me the victory over the bear and God gave me the victory over the lion, who is Goliath 
in the face of our mighty God. And so David trusted in God. He didn't trust in his own power and his own might, but he trusted a created, creative God who created the universe. And I don't know about you, but it is that same God, that same God that we have access to. So when you come face to face with that Goliath size challenge, that, that, that challenge that seems larger than life, that challenge that is taunting you, that challenge that is speaking negatively of you, that challenge that is making you feel small. God has given us the power to let us know the same way he brought us through it before is the same way he's going to bring it through it again. And David trusted God. I wonder if we can learn something from David. And the same trust that David had in God is the same trust we can have in God. How many of you believe that there is no challenge in the world that God can overcome? All it requires for us is to have faith in him and to have trust in him. But not only do we need to have trust in God, but we also have to have trust in ourselves. We have to have trust in ourselves. And I'm not saying that in a prideful manner. I'm saying that we have to have trust in ourselves. My beloved in Christ, don't you know that you have been uniquely made in the image and likeness of God? And, and because you have confessed with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you not only have to have trust in God, but you have to have trust in yourself. That God has placed you in whatever situation and circumstance you currently might be in for his purpose and for his glory. And you have to trust in him, no matter what Goliath-sized challenge you might be facing. You see, my beloved in Christ is in verses 38 through 39 that we see where Saul put his own military clothes on David. And we see that he put on his bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on his armor. But, and David strapped his sword over the military clothes and tried to walk. Have you ever tried to walk in clothes that's too small or too big for you? My beloved in Christ, here we have David realizing, and he even says in the text, I can't walk in these. I know uh, Dr. John Upton, who's my predecessor as the executive director of the BGAV, has spent, had spent uh, 30 years as a part of the BGAV and over 20 years as the executive director. And one of the things people ask me as I come into this role is, how are you going to fill John's shoes? How are you going to, you there is that, those are some big shoes to fill. You know what I tell them? I tell them, I'm not trying to wear John's shoes. I'm actually trying to change the shoe. You see, you can't wear other people's stuff when God has uniquely called you to do what he's called you to do. You see, my beloved in Christ, as we think about this text, it says, so David took them off. David relieved himself of somebody else's clothes because David realized that there is a difference between the clothes of the king and being clothed by the king. Oh, I wish I had some help in here. <laughs> Look, there is a difference between trying to wear the clothes of the king with the little K and being clothed by the king with the big K. I don't know about you, but when I accepted Christ in my life, that's the greatest feeling of the world because that was a transformative experience. That was a powerful experience that God had placed on my life. And I began to walk my walk and to talk my talk. I wonder if there's anybody here that just want to walk they walk and talk they talk in terms of what God has in store for you because there is a difference. There is a difference between trying to wear the clothes of the king rather than being clothed by the king. And I want to encourage you today that if you have confessed with your mouth and you have believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and his Holy Spirit is dwelling in you, that you have been clothed by the king. Come on, turn to the person next to you and say, I've been clothed by the king. 
Oh, I don't believe you. 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 Say it with conviction. I've been clothed by the king. Amen. So not only do we have to trust God and not only do we have to trust ourselves, but as we look at the first part of verse 40, as we look at the first part of verse 40, it says that instead David took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi. As many of you know from a, a historical standpoint and from a Hebrew standpoint, that this idea of wadi actually means a riverbed. So here we have David, once he realized who he was in God, goes to the riverbed, and it says that he chose five smooth stones. And that helps me to understand that not only do we have to trust God, not only do we have to trust ourselves, but my beloved in Christ, when we find ourselves confronted with that Goliath-sized challenge, we have to trust in God's supply. I didn't get one amen on that one. <laughs> Listen, we have to trust in God's supply. Amen. amen. There you go. Amen. I don't know about you, but when I get down on my knees and I pray the Lord's Prayer, part of that prayer is, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. How many of you know that's more than just physical sustenance, but that's also spiritual sustenance that we need, that we believe that whatever I might be confronted with in the day ahead, God is going to supply all of my need. And in this instance, in terms of David, it says that he took these five smooth stones, and as we recognize what David was trying to do here from a historical standpoint. I've been taught that, that David realized that Goliath had some brothers. And so therefore, he had to not only get a smooth stone for Goliath, but he knew that his brothers was going to be coming after him, and so he had to get some additional stones for Goliath's brothers. So how many of you know that a lot of times when we talk about our Goliath-sized challenges, that our Goliath's child-sized challenges don't come all by themselves. There is one challenge after another challenge, after another challenge, after another challenge, and I just want you to know and be encouraged that God has supplied you to victory over whatever challenges that might be coming your way, whether it's the first challenge or the second challenge or the third challenge. In this case, David had five smooth stones. And as I began to wrestle with what these five smooth stones might represent in the life of the church. I have to go all the way to the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Because how many of you know that in terms of the church, the church of the living God, the local church, I'm finding as I travel around the state, as I travel around the nation, as I travel around the world, our churches are faced with some Goliath-sized challenges. But Ephesians 4 help us to understand that God has uniquely equipped the church with a five-fold ministry. So I just believe in a New Testament context that these five smooth stones represent a, a apostolic stone. It represents a prophetic stone. It represents a evangelistic stone. It represents, my beloved in Christ, a pastor stone. It represents a teaching stone. So my beloved in Christ, First Baptist Alexandria, East End Baptist Church, God has equipped all of us as a local church with everything we need to overcome our challenges. All we have to do is utilize those five smooth stones that God has equipped us with in an apostolic way, in a prophetic way, an evangelistic way, in a prophetic way, my beloved in Christ, a pastoral way, and then, my beloved in Christ, a teaching way. So not only has God blessed us to trust him, trust ourselves, trust his supply, but as we look at the middle part of verse 40, the middle part of verse 40 says, David took these five smooth stones and put them in the pouch and in his shepherd's bag. That helps me to understand not only do we trust in God and ourselves and God's supply, but with David putting these stones in his shepherd's bag, 
helps me to understand that David trusted in God's guidance. God's guidance. I've often shared with people as I take this role as executive director that that I want God to be my guidance as we move forward. I want the Holy Spirit to, to lead the way. God has empowered us with this new vision of what God would, would have us to do, and that is to reach the people in this nation and around this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I shared this morning how God used 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 to call me into ministry. And that particular passage of scripture talks about uh, 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 empowering me to do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of my ministry. I don't know about you, but one of the things that attracted me to the BGAV some 22 years ago was the idea of missions and the idea of freedom. And that freedom comes in the form of how we're able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ for such a time as this. And God has been our guide every step of the way. And I believe God is going to continue to be our guide. But as we look at this idea of David putting these stones in the shepherd's bag, I came to the understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit that when it referred to the shepherd's bag, it wasn't talking about David's bag. It was talking about the shepherd's bag. And what I mean by that is it was David who wrote the 23rd Psalm. And it's in that 23rd Psalm where David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So the fact that David put those five smooth stones in his shepherd's bag means that David put those five smooth stones back into the hands of God who was his shepherd. Because my beloved in Christ, when you're facing those Goliath-sized challenges, you have to take God's supply and put it back in God's hand. Because when it is in God's hand, it is in a strong hand. When it's in God's hand, it's in powerful hands. If it's in God's hand, it is in a transformative hand. Listen, if it is in God's hand, it is in some victorious hands. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather put my situation and circumstances in God's hand than rather for me trying to figure it out. I would rather put my situation circumstances in God's hand than for me to try to come up against. And so we see David realizing that the Lord was his shepherd and he shall not want. I shared earlier how uh, my mother used to tell me whenever I was facing a, a big challenge and, and, and whenever I was, whether it was a test at school, whether it was in sports or whether it was whatever the case may be, she would always tell me, before you face the challenge, recite the 23rd Psalm. I don't know about you, but my mother was a prophet. Because every time I'm faced with a challenge, I say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. Thou anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever and ever. I wonder if I got some 23rd Psalm reciters in the house. Oh, you ought to say amen on that one. Because God is our guidance, and as long as we keep his supply in his shepherd's bag, everything is going to be all right. So now, since David trusted God, now that David trusted himself, now that David trusted God's supply, now that David trusted God's guidance, verse 40, the latter part, that David was ready to approach his Philistine. I wonder if there's anybody here today that is ready. Whatever that challenge might be facing you when you leave this church service, no matter what challenge might be facing you when you on your job tomorrow, no matter what challenge that might be facing you this upcoming week, no matter what 
challenge that seems so big and so, so large, that challenge that is taunting you because you trust in God, because you trust in yourself, because you trust in God's supply, because you trust in God's guidance. You are ready. I said you are ready. You are ready to approach your Philistine. Because, my beloved in Christ, the final point I want to make, that because you've trusted in God, because you've trusted yourself, because you've trusted God's supply, because you've trusted God's guidance, now you have to trust this God-sized moment. Because there is nothing that can overcome a Goliath-sized challenge than a God-sized moment. God has called you to this moment. You got to trust in him. God has called you to this moment so that you might overcome. God has called you to this moment that you might have the victory. Because if you have the victory in the name of the Lord, then he gets the victory in that God-sized moment. You don't have to believe me. The story of Esther proves this. The Bible tells us in this story how it was a Goliath-sized challenge that the Jewish people were facing. And Mordecai, her uncle, came to her and said, look, I know you got it made, but it's time for you to stand up for justice, truth, and righteousness. And the Bible tells us that Esther encouraged her people to pray for her and to fast for her. And so she said to them, if I perish, I perish but I'm going to see the king. If I perish, I perish, but I'm going to see the king. Esther realized that she had this God-sized moment that was ordained for her. And so she had to overcome that Goliath-sized challenge that was facing and in her way. I'm reminded of another story of a God-sized moment. And we're going to be celebrating it in a couple of weeks. The Bible tells us of this Goliath-sized challenge that Jesus faced. But how many of you know that Goliath-sized challenge was on a Friday? That Goliath-sized challenge was death itself. That Goliath-sized challenge was a tomb with a stone rolled in front of it. But how many of you know that early one Sunday morning, that that was a God-sized moment that gave Jesus the power to get up from the grave? And so if Jesus can get up from the grave, you can get up from whatever you might be facing. You can get up. Whatever might be challenging you, you can get up because this is your moment. This is your time. Facing our Goliath-sized challenges. The only thing that can overcome those challenges is if we trust in God, trust in ourselves, trust in God's supply, trust in God's guidance, and trust that God has brought us to this God-sized moment to deliver us from whatever challenge we might be facing. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. As we come to this moment of invitation and public invitation to you as you, you, you think about what God, as a matter of fact, let's, let's, let's uh, pause for just a moment. Let me, let me just pray for us. Let's pray for us. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for this moment in time. We do not take this moment for granted. Lord, we thank you for what our ears have heard, what our eyes have seen. God, you've been so sweet to us with your word today as we've engaged the story of David and Goliath, and that story has engaged us. I can't speak for anyone else, but I feel encouraged. I feel excited. I feel empowered that I can face whatever Goliath-sized challenge that might be in my way. As I continue to trust in you, as I continue to trust in, in, in the person that you have made me, as I tr continue to trust in your supply, as you supply all of my needs, as I continue to trust in your guidance, and I continue to trust that this is a God-sized moment, that you have uniquely made. Not that I might get any glory, but that you might get the glory. 
so that you might be edified and you might be glorified. And for that, we are grateful. And for that, we give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'd like to extend the invitation to you to accept Christ as your personal Savior as uh, the musicians prepare our hearts and minds with singing, Tis So Sweet. Uh, how many of you know that he is sweet to our spirit? He's sweet to our moments. And I don't know about you, but I just love being in the sweet spot with Jesus. Let us sing. Please stand. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to Thank you. Please be seated. I want to invite our worshipers to come forward and prepare to receive the tithes and offerings. But as they do so, let me lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are and for the opportunity we have to gather together in worship. We thank you for being a God who supplies all of our needs and being a God who is prepared for whatever we are facing. Father, we do desire to glorify you with all of our lives. And so, Father, be glorified as we continue to worship. We thank you and we ask all this in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
What wonderful assurance we have in Christ Jesus. Amen. What a blessing it has been to gather together this morning in worship. We're so thankful that you and your family are here. We're going to close together in a song of benediction. So why don't we all stand together one more time. And Brother Don, lead us as we close. As we face those Goliaths this week, we have the solid rock of Christ on which we stand. Please join as we sing on Christ the Solid Rock. Sunday, you're dismissed.